Shadow Planet, written by Cherish Monster, Action Girl, and Buzz Magister. Read and edited by Action Girl. Hoyt stretched as he leaned against a discarded trash barrel. Idiot, he whistled and tapped the loose grate over a cistern. Don't call him that, Sama frowned. At ten, she possessed two virtues her father would have been hard-pressed to define, common sense and compassion. He has a name. Told you not to name that thing. You ain't keeping him. I am too, Hoped. None of your business I gave Toby some of my rations. Summer cuddled the little terrier and cooed softly. It's okay, sweetie, she said. We'll find somewhere to light soon. Toby broke away. He squealed with delight and wriggled in front of her. Hey, Toby. Hope tapped the unsteady grate. I've seen a lot of folks go down the tubes trusting. His voice was eerily guttural. He tapped the grate again. Toby jumped up. The grate twanged, wobbled, and collapsed. The terrier's body contorted as he fell. His dark eyes ballooned in the terror of finality. When you connect with the eyes of any living being in panic of their death, it imprints on your mind forever. Summer screamed the scream of the netherworld. That thing was plain stupid. First law, remember, trust nobody. So just quit, Sam. Second law, remember. She gritted her yellow stained teeth and pushed him. Leave them who betray. The world is full of simpletons, Sarah. You're a kid. Who'll take care of you? I take care of myself as it is. There'll be nothing new. Where would you go? Not would. Am. You're not a dad, you know. You may be my father by blood, but you've never been a real dad. You murdered my dog. Well, Missy, it was a dog. How can you murder her? He was a he, and if you don't know, I can't tell you. Sama interrupted, her raspy voice louder. She began to chew the inside of her mouth, a habit she developed as a baby whenever she felt deep anger. Stop. Hoat said perfunctorily, and patted her cheek. You'll cause a sore. Don't touch me. Summer jerked away. She squared her narrow shoulders, turned up her pug nose and whirled around. You're being a brat. Don't talk to me. Summer brushed the dust from her tattered jeans. They moved as if straightening an invisible tie. Goodbye, Hoat. She nodded without looking back. If we see each other in hell, eventual. Don't talk to me then. Summer had lived all her life foraging amongst the trash of the only settlement she'd known, back at the edge of Shutter Desert. She'd been told it existed only because of special winds and an underground cavern of fresh water that was able to be tapped and used by the few engineers remaining who had found that special pocket once the rest of Shudder Planet had been coated with debris and ash after the event a hundred years ago. The event had plunged the world into a gloom that caused mass extinction and left soil and sky barren and uninhabitable for almost all living things. Of course, those creatures who were used to the frigid deep of the ocean and dark depths underground were able to survive and the few people who were in outer space, underwater, and underground at the time, were the only inhabitants. Summer had been born after those stragglers had died out or had found their way to the tiny oasis. The gloom was meant to last another hundred years, perhaps a thousand. Regardless of how long, those who were left were rough, tough survivors. Sama hadn't known her mother. 
all she knew had been like pulling teeth with persistent questioning of her father. Since the event, conceiving a child was rare, carrying it to full term was rarer still, and successfully giving live birth was rarest of all. Summer's father had delivered her placenta and sewn up her mother's torn perineum as best he could with the crude tools he had and rags that were far from sterile. It was cruel that infection had set in and took her mother's life slowly. It was a testimony to her mother's fiery spirit and devotion to her child as she fought to stay alive and thereby nourish her tiny daughter with precious colostrum and then mother's milk to give her a fighting chance in the barren world. Nine months, the amount of time she had been in her mother's womb, 37 weeks inside and 37 weeks outside, was the exact amount of time she had spent with her mother. Her father, although a lean, mean survivor himself, might not have been able to enjoy a pet terrier, had cared as best he could for his ailing partner, and then this small child. He had no experience of handling a child, and had especially had no experience of loving one, having no siblings nor friends, hailing from generation after generation of scavengers who managed to procreate, but not live long enough afterwards. What he knew was a few laws of survival and to teach her how to make her weekly rations last twice as long. And that's what he did for ten years. He did not have it in him to teach her kindness or fun or reading or writing. But then again, nobody had taught him those things either. Sama, however, had developed these additional skills through her own keen mind and open heart. Sama's full name was Samakan. Her mother had chosen it, her mother's name being Samantha. Her father had shortened it to Sama so that it wouldn't be so similar to his dead partner. Even so, she was almost an exact miniature of her mother that it hurt him to look upon her and face his own part in her death, having been the reason she'd been with child, and his rough attempt at sowing flesh. He had always blamed himself, it had now been a week since Toby, her beloved terrier, had plunged to his death, and since Sama had broken away from Hote. She had meted her remaining rations with great care, but now they were well and truly gone. She had no water, no food, and now no shelter, as she passed the dunes. In the staggered dunes there had been clumps of scrub, sprinkled every half day or so of travelling. She could use the sparse vegetation to spark up a small fire with her flint and to make crude bedding for some rest. But now, as she looked out across the crest of the highest dune, she saw, reaching out in all directions and touching the sky, an endless, flat grey. The skies were that strange pale red which looked so different to anything that was seen on terror. The night sky was a dark red, people called it navy red, in a joke which the survivors no longer understood the meaning of. But people laugh at humour of ancient events woven into their folklore. Summer was becoming desperate when she sheltered as best she could during the nights, which by a strange quirk of f fate were about as long as terror nights. When the first settlers arrived, they had remarked on this synchronicity and how it was very strange. Some of the stranger settlers had attributed this to a long-forgotten deity and called it a sign. Quotes had been passed around by people with odd ideas about purposes of life. These were, however, suppressed by authority. It doesn't pay to have beliefs, was the party line. Whatever that meant, for no one knew what a party or a party line was. It was not encouraged. Trust no one and be self-sufficient was the new creeder. 
as she stood there watching the increasing intensity of the red sky, which heralded a slight increase in warmth, Summer became distracted by a noise behind her. Summer looked, and there stood a small figure dressed in the real navy blue garments, looking benignly at her. Hello, Summer. It is so nice to see you. It's nice to be back. The figure greeted her as if he knew her well. Who are you? she asked. Strangely, there should be no one there, and this being was inexplicable to an adult. Children, however, are more accepting of strange events, and as there was no precedent for this sighting, no stories or folklore were available. Well, perhaps there were, but Summer's father had isolated himself so thoroughly that he would not have shared hopeful stories of sightings with his daughter. You are all on your own again, but if you allow me, then I can help you, Summer. The small figure told her. What's your name? Summer asked him. Oh, you know that it's Toby, the small being told her. Look into my eyes. Summer moved closer and looked into the dark eyes, which were beautiful and darker than coal. Deep-coloured irises which you could fall into. Yes, there was such a depth. Toby, it is you. Summer felt a tear of joy fall down her cheek. But of course it is me, the diminutive being told her. I'd wag my tail, but in this form I haven't got one. How did you? Summer started to ask. I mean, where did you? I mean, no, it's not possible. She wept with joy. Now, Summer, you need to go back to your father or you will die. The old fool is grieving and needs you, or he too will die. But there is one point that I must tell you before you return. He will not be able to see me at all. Toby looked at Summer with an even gaze. Summer accepted his advice, but was very upset. He killed you, and I hate him for that. The small being laughed at her. He cannot kill me. Did you ever find it strange that you had a dog? Summer, there are no dogs on this planet. It would be wasteful of resources. Well, I guess if you say so, Toby. She was puzzled, but accepted this information as being accurate, and so decided to go back to the despicable Hote, the killer of her beloved terrier. The little being seemed to read her mind and answered her thoughts with a joke. I don't think you're in Kansas any more, Dorothy, he laughed, a gentle and reassuring laugh. What on earth is that supposed to mean? Summer asked him. Oh, don't worry, it is of no consequence. Toby laughed and the two companions made their way back. Summer had been an independent girl for as long as she could remember. Push someone away for long enough and they realised that they can't be hurt anymore. She raged about the loss of her dog who had been so important to her and the vile nature of one who would kill such a poor and defenceless being as her dog. She did not believe in her dream ghost and was not going to follow his advice. The anger grew. How could a ghost, even in a dream, trick her in this way? She shut her mind to the idea and struck out further from the place. If that thing is going to follow me, then I'm sure going to keep moving. She cared little for the danger any more, and her ability to open up emotionally had been closed. She was in Ireland and roamed across the barren planet, which seemed to reflect the emotional void which was her mind. Hope stretched as he leaned against the trash can. This is becoming a habit, he thought to himself. Now, where in tarnation was that good-for-nothing Summer gotten to? He startled as he heard a sound of scratching coming from down the drain. That damn dog! It's still here. It's down the drain scratching and scurrying. Damn, I'm going to have to get it out and find that good-for-nothing girl. As if I ain't got enough things to do. He said this to himself and believed it. 
It made no sense, but he cleared the drain and offered a pitiful amount of food. But that's all you get on the substance row, a pitiful amount of food. He laughed scornfully. Damn, now I'm going to have to go after her. But I ain't saying sorry. She's got to learn trust no one. Then the kid can't get hurt. Trust no one. His coda was wearing a bit thin, and he couldn't see it. The scratching increased. Half an hour and the dog was out and wagging its tail in that annoying way. You're a lucky dog. Now we've got to go find her. Oh, well, dog, let's go. The dog looked at him and with those blacker than black eyes and weighed him up. But Hoach was oblivious to that. He was turned in on himself and had long since forgotten how to turn his views outwards. But the two set off. Funny, I could have sworn I just saw a yellow brick on the ground. But he knew this was nonsense. A strange story from my younger years. Hope thought back to the old man, the one who used to carve things out of pieces of something which he had told Hoot was called Jet. This is ancient, son. Someone once told me it was a part of things called trees. They said this place once had forests, whatever they were. The old man sat on a rock seat which he had made with his own hands and rudimentary tools. Hoat had forgotten the old man for so long, life was so hard, that it was difficult to think past the day-to-day matters of existence. The old man had something greater, a kind of dignity and acceptance of his place in this place, which offered only hardship and going without. Why had he remembered this old man, this person, a relation, a fountain of wisdom? Not the kind of wisdom on how to do things, more how to accept and see everything and wonder. Not a typical settler, but a dreamer who carved pieces of black, soft rock into useless but beautiful artefacts. Hoat smiled and knew he could reach summer, and in this moment he had regained peace of mind. It didn't matter about keeping hold of things and rationing things out. Hoat realised that someone was more important and a link back to her mother. He realised the real treasure was his daughter. This made the decision simple. There was no decision he had to find Summer before something awful happened to her. He set off with some meagre supplies and the dog. The dog became disconcerted at this new mood, but started to lead the father in the direction of his daughter. Hote found Summerkin huddled at the top of the highest dune just under a day later. She, of course, had not been directly seven days' travel from the oasis. Due to the treacherous shifting dunes and the ever-shuddering motion of the land, what looked to be new areas and progress had merely been an illusion. Sama had walked in a very wide circle around the settlement. When she thought she had finally reached the highest crest, she was actually very close to where she had begun. Having never had reason to teach her how to find her way using the sun, stars and moon, Hote had not passed on the knowledge he didn't possess about the grade of the earth and its ability to dupe a wanderer into thinking they are walking a straight line, especially when there are no other landmarks except flat greyness and a tiny circumference of scrub and bush around the one and only basin of life. She was feverish and half-conscious, and muttering about dream ghosts and Toby. But being who she was, she appeared physically intact and far from death.